Ooh, it's a Piwaka Waka. Okay, hang on. Wait. Hang on. Oh. Too slow. Kia ora koto. Go Jessa Toku Ikawa. Akai Tafara Tauka o Otago Aho e Mahiana. Hi everyone. My name is Jessa and I work at the Otago Museum. And it's been such a beautiful day in my bubble today that I thought I'd take advantage of all the sunshine to gear up and get some practice in for the Otago Wildlife Photography Competition. And boy, do I need it. But it's also got me thinking a lot about how closely related photography is to my shadow puppet shows. You see, they both rely on the fact that light wants to travel in straight lines. With shadows, that straight line of travel gets blocked or absorbed, which is how we see a shadow behind the object. But that straight line of travel can also be changed if it's reflected. And I'm not just talking about the annoying kind of reflections, like when white light reflects off a shiny surface and it makes it hard to see. All around us, all the time, objects are reflecting some wavelengths of light and absorbing others. When those wavelengths are reflected, they travel off in countless new straight lines and countless new directions, some of which reach our eyes and our brain translates them into green leaves or whatever it is we're looking at. Similarly, when we point a camera at something, some of those new wavelengths, some of those new lines of travel will enter the opening in the camera called the aperture and construct an image of whatever it is that reflected them. You can see what I mean by building this really cool little device in your own home, in your own bubble, called a camera obscura. Camera obscura is Latin for dark chamber, and it's been around for centuries. And actually its basic design is what the, these modern cameras are based on. And fortunately for you, we can make them with things that you have in your own bubble. So come on with me and I'll show you. For my camera obscura, I used an empty tissue box but you can use a cereal box or any kind of box that is enclosed. I also needed scissors, masking tape or duct tape or any other kind that doesn't let light through, a push pen, and some baking paper or tracing paper. First, I cut the bottom of the box completely off. Then, I taped a piece of baking paper over the opening I had created. This is tricky because the tape will not want to stick to the baking paper. So I suggest applying the tape to the paper first and then to the bottom of the box. To ease the tension in the corners, I just sort of cut a little slit so that the corners could fold over themselves. Now reattach the bottom of the box to the top of the box using the rest of your duct tape. The black is really good, but you just wanna make sure that all of the cut sides are completely covered so that no light can get it. If you run out like I did, silver will do. Masking tape can work too. Once reattached, use the push pin to poke a hole right in the middle of the bottom. And you are ready to go. Now, if you're using a tissue box for your camera obscura, you can just use the hole that's already in it. If you're using a box that doesn't have a hole, you'll want to cut one for your eye, but don't make it too big because you don't want to let too much light into that area opposite the pinhole. Light has a really hard time competing with itself and it'll make it hard to see an image inside the box. But if you point your pinhole at a sunny landscape and you put your eye up to it, you'll be able to see that landscape reflected in your camera obscura. But I can't really show you, because it's too small. Fortunately, Dr. Harold Schwiefel from the Dodwall Center at the University of Otago turned an entire room into a camera obscura over the weekend with his kids. Now, Harold used a piece of cardboard with a hole that he had punched in it with a, a pencil and some really, really dark curtains, but it means that he can show you exactly what the image produced by a camera obscura looks like. So over to you, Harold. Here we have a pinhole. You cannot really see anything through there. It's very bright. Let's see the image. 
back on this piece of paper here. Carlotta standing outside waving and Greta holding the curtain tight so that it not, is nice and dark in here. Perfect. Thanks Harold and Carlotta and Greta. That was really, really helpful. Now, for those of you watching at home, did any of you notice something a little weird about the image of Carlotta that was produced by the camera obscura? Here's a picture that Harold took of Carlotta outside with a normal camera. And as you can see, she is definitely not standing on her head. So why is the image that a camera obscura produces look upside down and backwards to us? Surprise, surprise, it has to do with light traveling in straight lines. Let me explain. When you point the pinhole at a scene, wavelengths that are reflected from the top of the scenery have to travel downwards to reach the pinhole. And when they do, they'll continue traveling downwards to get to the paper. Similarly, light that's reflected from the bottom of the scene has to travel upwards, meaning that we will see it at the top of the paper inside the camera obscura. Same with left and right. Some modern cameras actually use mirrors to flip that back to front. And nowadays we use computers to do that. Now here's an investigation for you to undertake at home. What happens if you make the pinhole larger or smaller? Can you make it too large or too small? Ask your parents if you can share your investigations at Otago Museum's Facebook page, because we'd love to know what you find out. For now though, I'd better take advantage of the, the sunshine while it lasts and try and get a few good photos in. Remember, if you are looking for things to do, Otago Museum's website has a ton of online content to keep you busy until we can be open again and see you back in the museum. Until then, stay safe and be well.